Hey everyone, Neil Brennan. I'm not going to set up the premise of the podcast anymore, but I guess the question is, do you want to heal the earth? Let's heal the earth. My guest today is probably the most, I, I know you don't like, who likes superlatives, but you've done really well for yourself. And you've done really well with other people. I'm the Jewish Neil Brennan. You are the Jewish <laughs> Neil Brennan. You've done well for yourself. You've done well with in collaboration. I looked it up on ChatGBT. Have you ch ChatGBT yourself? No. I have ChatGBT app on my phone. I said, what are Judd Apatow's most successful projects? ChatGBT said, Judd Apatow is known for several successful projects, including TV shows like Freaks and Geeks and Undeclared, which is like leading with that is interesting. Chat GPT loves undeclared. Chat GPT, yeah. Uh, the 40 year old virgin. No, Kelly Clarkson. Knocked up. I'm pregnant. Uh, off. Super bad. McLovin? This is 40. The therapist said you're not allowed to judge me. And train wreck. Who's your favorite team? The Orlando Blooms. He often falls, falls within the comedy genre <laughs> and has garnered both critical acclaim and commercial success. I think they should have mentioned. I'll tell you what the, I think they should have mentioned instead of Undeclared and Freaks and Geeks. Bridesmaids. Party! And McKay Farrell, to me. That's what I would have done. ChatGPT Chat does not like the McKay Farrell movie. It's <laughs> just apparently. so weird. You would think ChatGPT would be all over that. Shots fired. <laughs> um, Judd Apatow's here, everybody. And you were saying earlier, uh, uh, as we started rolling, that you don't, you're done trying to look good. Well, this is also part of the podcast's world as you show up places and they're like there's a video component mm -hmm. now when i'm gonna be uh you know walking a red carpet there's a glam team they're trying to figure out how to make this all work visually mm -hmm. you show up on a podcast you're getting the real this is what real walking stuff. around this is what you look like at work this is this is a the lot day. of thigh and black <laughs> socks and shorts this is and it. i don't want to say it's beyond jewish I, you know it what? It might be beyond <laughs> Jewish. I can't blame it on Judaism. When I was dressing today, I thought, I think I'm behind a desk, and so I don't have to wear pants. No, no. <laughs> so, um, it's but thank you for coming. Uh, I, I, where have you been? Uh, I haven't seen you in I, six months. I've been in uh, London. Oh yeah, you've been in London. Jimmy Carr told me you were in London. I saw Jimmy Carr there. You have to see him if you're yep, there. Yeah, of course you have to check in. Great man. And then uh, my daughter's uh, uh, Maud is in cabaret. Oh, in West End. In oh, Sally in Bowles. London. So I went there, went to see that eight times. Did you literally? Oh, yeah. Going back to see it a few more times. When does Pride stop kicking in and notes start? When does Pride end and notes begin? Never? Maud's very, made it very clear. My notes are terrible. She's, she's just. Has she, has she chat gpt would you? <laughs> <laughs> they I, must have had some good notes. You know what my note is? I just say this to her after every show. I go, ham it up. Ham it up. <laughs> and she's like, please, can you stop saying ham it up? That's it's, the only note I have. The theater so is not funny. my thing. So you don't want you don't want notes from me. So she doesn't get any. Maud's the older one? Yes. She's on Euphoria as well? She is. What was your name again? Lexi. And is the younger one an actor as well? She is an actress I, as well. Is it? Yes. Uh, Iris. Iris, yes. She was on Love. The, the oh, right. That we did. Okay, good. Chat GPT didn't like, care for it. Didn't make it. Chat GPT loves the bubble. The bubble, your movie, The Bubble. Yeah. Chat GPT loves You it. had a very, I, I also want to <laughs> say that you have some of my favorite jokes. Uh, you had a good joke about The Bubble, which is it was less, it was on Netflix and it was less popular than Is It Cake? Yes. <laughs> And then you watched it. You watched Is It Cake? And you were like, this is better than the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> um, you also have my favorite joke about m men having sex. I don't want to botch it. Do you remember the joke? What we're trying to ride the line between. Oh, walking a fine line between impotence and premature ejaculation. That's what m being a man having sex is walking a fine line between impotence and premature ejaculation. Women, if you're wondering what it's like for us, <laughs> Judd nailed it yes you also had a great bill cosby bit um about bill you did a bill cosby impression <laughs> which no one saw coming you ever been in trouble with the wife <laughs> and bill cosby going was it going to the mail the the mailbox to get it was a a bit in bill cosby's voice of him going to the end of the driveway every day and hiding the paper so Camille wouldn't know he was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> he snuck out to the 
driveway to get the paper. And you did it, and it was very funny. You did it on uh, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. I wasn't going to do it, so I was working on the Fallon set, and I was doing that bit, but no plan to do it on TV. Didn't think you could do that. And then a few comedians the night before were like, oh, no, you have to you yeah. have to do that. So, I, you know, the thing with you is, I think you always just get like successful, right? Like just it's successful. And like no one really knows what you do. They just know that you are involved in successful things. I've been very, very tangentially involved and seen some of the things you've done. I went to the a read through for train wreck that was not good. And then within four months, you guys were shooting and the movie was very good. What did you do? Give me an example of what the, uh, to, when I at the read through I went to, it was very amorphous, didn't have good shape, didn't have like clear beats. I'm assuming that's fairly exemplary of what you've done with people. Explain to people what that what you do in these situations well I, I don't really remember that table read specifically it wasn't like a awful it was just kind of like Meh. it was like fine yeah i mean so much of it is when it comes to life you know you're with like how how good are the jokes going to work when lebron james is not at the table read yeah so so part of my job is to go don't panic yeah we just had our friend read that yeah. And that's going to play differently when LeBron you did James it. Actually, is. you played LeBron. You did one of your famous black voices. Oh, yes, exactly. Um, Maybe that, that's why it bombed at, yeah, that, yeah. at that table. And it was like real 70s ish. Like, <laughs> say, baby. You had, you said, say, baby, at say the baby. beginning of every one of LeBron's lines. And it was very offensive. I loved it personally. You used to people, be able to. People yeah. hated it. You used to be, I forgot to get the paper. <laughs> Times have changed. Uh, but I mean, I think for all those things, you're just trying to be very open to criticism so for instance like a lot of times people will do a movie and they'll show up for rehearsals like two days before the shoot and they'll do a table read then and maybe it's the only time they've ever done a table read yeah so the main thing i did was say let's do a table read four months before shooting and we will have four months to, to learn it. from it and fix yeah. it and i think most people would do that table read the week before and and that's a massive choice just right I there i totally agree and that's your tv training i'm assuming yes Again, if you don't know, you probably don't know because you're not old. Ben Stiller, the movie actor, now director, uh, a Ben Stiller who's a fucking killer director. Uh, Tropic Thunder is a near perfect comedy, and I would, mm -hmm. I think you would probably agree with that. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. You and Ben Stiller created a sketch show called the Ben Stiller Show uh, in 1991. Uh, it aired in 92, yeah. Yeah, and it was a great show, and it was canceled, and then you guys won an Emmy. Judd, Molly Madden, uh, Jimmy Miller, everybody who made this possible, thank you. That was your first real organized, that was the first time you played, like, organized ball, right? Yes. And what did you, what was that like? Well, here's the funniest thing, is now we're talking about the Ben Stiller show, and it's 30 years ago, uh -huh. right? <laughs> And so I, whenever anyone talks about something that's 30 years ago, I always think, so if this was the 70s and we were reflecting back to something 30 years ago, we're talking about the 40s, right? I know. Like, we're, you know, yes. like if it's music, it's like, you know, Chuck Berry. Yeah. That, that, that always blows my mind. Sinead O'Connor. Sinead O'Connor. I don't uh, want to tell a joke when there's so much suffering in the world. Is dead. Prince is, I'm just thinking about people that were like popular when the Ben Stiller show was on. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a whole Adam Yow, dead from the yeah. Beast Boys. You guys would play the Beast Boys in the interstitials, I remember. Sound alikes. So, I know, they were sound alikes, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, they had a record that was all just uh, instrumental. Instrumental, so it was incredible. Yeah. And so we said, oh, well, let's just do funk music instrumentals yes. between everything. But with the Ben Stiller show, I met Ben online at an Elvis Costello unplugged concert. I was with Dana Gould, and he had met Ben before. Ben had just had a TV show on. Uh, MTV, mm -hmm. which was very before Larry Sanders, very Larry Sanders esque of behind the scenes of a sketch show. And we thought of this idea, and like two weeks later, we sold it. Everyone thought we had been friends for years, and we literally just met. And I had produced some stand up specials, and you know, not much. My resume looked better than what I had actually learned how to do. So most of my work with Ben was drafting off of the fact that Ben really knew what he was doing yeah. and I was catching up.
So where would you say you learned the most? When I think of you at the Larry Sanders show, it feels like an apprenticeship. Yes. Underneath Gary, right? And was Absolutely. Stiller that similar? Not necessarily. You and you and Ben were closer in age, but I'm saying, was it? Because you'd done a TV, you did a sketch show, and then you hadn't done a narrative, and then you started working with Gary? Yes. Well, I mean, with Ben, he had already basically invented what he wanted to do, which yeah. was uh, very cinematic yeah. parodies and Single sketches. camera parodies and shoots. I mean, it's basically what we did on Chappelle show. Like, yeah. same thing. And he, you know, he always loved Albert Brooks, yeah. those SNL movies, and the films from SNL, and, uh, you know, he always said, this is SCTV if they had more budget. And I would also like to give a shout, a shout out to Robert Townsend, who did a Yes, incredible. Who did a bunch of HBO specials uh, with single camera cutaways. We got film clips, everything. Keep your eyes on that monitor. Bold, the black, the beautiful. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, him and Keenan were doing amazing things. And and so I learned a ton, you know, watching uh, Ben, but I also had to run the room and I'd never run a room. I'd never even been in a room. And so there was a uh, lot of that. A writer's room of eight people. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's, and that's a Bob Odenkirk was in that room. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? And so it, it was a pretty hardcore and we were trying to not do it the way SNL did it. So, you know, we would work on sketches till we thought they were ready to shoot where SNL reads them. And if they're, they don't get on the show, it's pretty hard to get them on the yeah. show after yeah. that. Sometimes it happens, yeah. but we were like, well, let's just keep polishing things. So we think they're ready to, to shoot. And we had a different system that we were working on, uh, which looking back, we lasted one season and SNL is about to do 50. So yeah. maybe uh, our adjustment of the system wasn't exactly right. Yeah, but right. that's, I, I don't think you guys also want an Emmy, but, <laughs> but, the, um, but I, yeah, I learned a ton from Ben. from those places? You no, know, from Ben, a lot about how he was shooting. So we would do these sketches like Ben doing a parody of Tony Robbins. I am not evil. I am not the devil. Ben would improvise. So we'd write the script and then Ben would go, I'm going to keep going. Well, yeah. I'd never seen that. I wasn't part of Second City or the Groundlings. Yeah. And we would write extra jokes. And Ben did these sketches where he played an agent, Michael Ferre, like Ferret. Uh -huh. And he would pitch projects to people like Roseanne and Tom or run DMC. And sometimes Ben would say, I don't want to say these jokes to their face. So we told them we were done shooting. They would leave and we would keep going on his single and shoot all these like terrible ideas for their careers. Yeah, and then and you cut in them going hmm. exactly. Yeah, and uh, and so you know, cinematically, writing wise, editing. But that's kind. Of, what's funny is that's kind of your what is is like the Apatow style. Oh yeah, and it's is, not my it, style. No, I, of at course all. not. But uh, yeah. it's uh, but it's, it's known it, as like well, no, they they improvise a lot. Like that's on the Judd yeah. movies. You set up four camera. You basically do what we're doing, which is like yeah. a wide and two singles. I just and, embraced it in a big way uh, and tried to create a financial situation where people had time to do it. That's your, in the movies and the TV shows. Yeah, to say, you know, of course, Adam McKay came from, you know, being one of the founders of UCB and yeah. Second City. He knew how to do all that. But for me as a producer of the first movie he directed, I'm trying to make sure that I can help him have time. Yeah. You know, to encourage it and to go, we have enough money to dick around till you riff and play with Will. Yeah. And, uh, and I did that for myself and for other people to say, this is a style that requires money. I mean, it, yeah. it, I mean if you're gonna- Well, it's also <laughs> scheduling, it's a, which is the same thing. It need, yeah. You need money. You need to shoot in this, uh, if it's 40-year-old version, you need to shoot in this uh, the junk place or whatever. Yeah. Like you need eight hours. Yeah. Whereas and, and most producers would say three. You go, let's do eight. Give me the money. Let's schedule. It was the full belief in it, and I had seen you know clips of you know Paul Reiser and Diner. I knew that he had made up most of his part. Yeah. That they just knew. Let's have a funny guy around, and we'll play. And and Barry Levinson comes from being in a comedy yeah. team. Uh, and that had a big effect on me. Like, oh, you can do it that way. And I had seen clips on like deleted scenes, where, like, you know, uh, stripes yeah. of Ramus and Bill Murray playing. Tonight we're going to go out and kill a wild boar. I think we should find a hotel room. And then when I saw Stiller do it, and then Shandling would do it, but he mainly did it either when we shot the talk show or in rehearsals, 
they would do the scene, but Gary would riff and play, and then it would get locked in the script. So the main thing I did was we could continue the thing Gary does in rehearsal while the cameras are rolling. Right. But Gary wouldn't do it. I guess he would take the best part of the rehearsal and put it in the exactly. And Sometimes do it again. he would, but it was you know we were shooting seventeen pages a day on film. Yeah, you know on rollerblades on roller. <laughs> yeah, with the cameras on rollerblades. So you know uh, when you do a movie, it's like four pages a day. Yeah, and we were doing seventeen a day, so it's you couldn't crazy. riff too much. Do you ever find yourself being arrogant? I think that would be the trap if I were you. Yeah, I no. I mean, I have to say that my low self esteem is the, the driver for all of it. I don't feel like the success of anything helps the next one work. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're correct. It's all an experiment. You could be wrong completely. I have been. And so I, there's, there's no place for, for that. <laughs> Maybe in, uh, the protecting the process. Right. You may evoke your credit to be like, you know, yeah. on 40 year old virgin when. It, yeah. You have to, to go, yeah. I don't want to screw this up. So if yeah. someone says, you know, can you do it for this budget? Can you change this thing? If it's really wrong, you, you try to protect what your vision is of it. But secretly, I don't know if any joke's going to work. I mean, part yeah. of the reason why I overshoot is a million times, whether I've done it or watching McKay do it, the thing that everyone talks about is the weird thing that Will Ferrell said, like, whatever, milk was a bad choice. Milk was a bad choice. I don't remember who thought of it, but it wasn't in the script. Yes. What's your favorite, I guess we don't have, I was going to say, what's your your favorite pitch of yours in anything that you can, that off the top of your head? Oh, <laughs> a favorite pitch or a joke? Oh my God. I don't know. I mean... I have to say, when we made the bubble, I found Fred Armisen to be so funny. It brought me so He's much so joy he was to watch so him funny. riff. And I also realized that if I didn't yell, Cut! he would never stop. No. He would go for 20 minutes and he would never like look at the camera and go, Did is that get, enough? Did he get? <laughs> yeah. And so one of the most fun I ever had was just like, I wanted him to be like cursing because all the actors are escaping the set. And of the dinosaur movie they're shooting and just telling Fred to just curse because he's never cursed the whole movie and just going fucking shit. Like, and, and seven minutes of Fred riffing, frustrated cursing, Fuck. man. I mean, that's like why I, I'm in the business is yes. to, to witness things. The one I always remember was uh, McKay uh, directing Will and there was a scene where he gets punched in the face, I think by Rudd and Anchorman too. Yep. And they just, rift reactions to getting punched really hard and at one point you know mckay pitched to him react like it it made you go back regress to where you're like four years old uh -huh. you're hit so hard you're four years old and it was just like punch and then will's just like a poop you're like whatever it was or and then mckay is like react like you got hit so hard that you can speak spanish and you know watching mckay and will no do i that. know mckay <laughs> has a gear that i've never seen yeah no one, no one can do that. where you're just like jesus christ um all right let's do uh judd apatow's blocks oh boy here um, we go this is great number one existential terror yes what are you afraid of son I feel like my existential terror has gotten a little better. Like as you get older, you're like, wouldn't be that bad to die. Yeah. You know, well, you, you know what the thing that people underrate with suicide, mm -hmm. it's a bit of like, I don't have to take this shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the, like life is so relentless and you're like, you know, I could end this. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit empowering. That was a line that Owen Wilson pitched when we wrote a script together in the nineties we were writing a movie for him and rip torn mm -hmm. and one of the lines he wrote for rip was uh sometimes the best thing you could say about life is you can end it whenever you want <laughs> um and i don't mean it in the sense of a, like a suicidal way i just mean like i saw this japanese chiropractor uh you know eastern medicine person the level of doctor <laughs> this guy's at you not it's not insurable it's brentwood no. only no, this is a cash situation yeah it's <laughs> the, you never you don't even look it up guys yeah. you can't it's word of mouth and you You'll gotta never know find her. yeah 
Uh, you got to know <laughs> like people that you can't believe someone would know. But as I'm getting acupuncture or something, I just said to her, like, how do you not be afraid of death? <laughs> she, right these are the conversations i have and she said uh you know you're supposed to be afraid of death you know when you're young you're supposed to be afraid of death and that's what your life is and you're trying to achieve and accomplish and have this life and then and she said you'll see as you get older it slowly dissipates and i have found that in, in, in a healthy way that i understand what that is you have a a youthful madness and energy mm -hmm. which i always think about uh, in, in terms of early in my career and all my friends the madness of thinking that you might succeed like the, the self-belief that was completely unjustified there was no proof there's no evidence that it would work it is out like a feel it's like a mania yes or like this this hope that borders on mania yeah and this like if i succeed if you and ben make a tv show that works you'll never have another problem it's so like you're set. And that's what I remember. It was like this thing of like, if it, it, everything would takes care of itself. It's like, I used to watch Kobe Bryant when he first got to the yeah. Lakers. I had season tickets and he just missed so many shots. Bryant for three. It's short again. Air ball. Air ball. Beyond rookie. Three times. He shot air ball. Zero pressure. And you would watch him and he was 18, 19 yeah. years old. And he didn't care. Yeah. It was just a part of him that was like, I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. And then he did. And I watched him figure it out uh, over you know a couple yeah. of years. But he had that madness of this is going to all work. This plan of having the courage to keep taking risks. Yes. It'll work. And that's what I look back and, and see with young people I know now. I think we're built to, to go for it and believe anything is possible and then you get older and you people get retreats and they get more scared and yeah. you know people make less movies and they slow down or they question what they're doing but there's something really wonderful about being in your 20s and being you know like a young tarantino lunatic making reservoir dogs or yeah paul thomas anderson making boogie nights yeah all right so what's the existential is it has it gotten how did it get better you'd think just time i know i my parents weren't religious at all, but they didn't replace it with anything. They never said we don't believe. They didn't even said they never even said we don't believe in God. Yeah. It was not discussed ever. Did you see you? But you would see it in movies, right? And go like, what? I mean, oh, God was out. Oh, God. I thought you didn't believe in me. Uh, that's just an expression. I loved oh, God. Of course. I was hanging on to oh, God for yeah. dear life. I wanted George Burns to be God. So it you had nothing. So I have nothing, and also in that period, there was a, an enormous amount of terror about Russia. <laughs> so in the you know the Reagan years, mm -hmm. early '80s, they were scaring us into thinking a nuclear attack was going to happen at any moment. Yes. So that, along with no religion, no spirituality, it's not like someone was explaining Buddhism to me, or reincarnation, or anything. That would just became a, a, a gaping hole that it's taken a lifetime to try to fill it with what, something. What is the, when you think, is it the, the however long the death sequence is? <laughs> is it, or is it the nothingness that you're afraid that will follow it? It's funny because I have a nothingness fear, but I also, if you said you can live forever, that's scarier to me, the idea of that. So there's no pleasing you. There's no place in me. <laughs> I'm screwed either way. The, why would that? I used to want to live forever. What? Why does that scare you? The enormity of it. Uh, it it's just too much. Oh, that's interesting. There is something structural about death that pleases the human psyche. Gets you off your ass. And you know, since then, you know, I've I've read a lot of Buddhism, and I'm, I'm interested in in all of those ideas. And I'm certainly not settled. But I, I, I probably have calmed down a lot compared to, to what it was. How would it man? Would it be like d panic attacks, dread? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just like, just when it got quiet, it, it was not really handleable for me. So only through meditation did I find a, a place in quiet and with myself that uh, was manageable. But for a long time, it was like keep your brain thinking about anything but that 
And that also drives workaholism and yeah. comedy and the absurdity of life. And isn't it weird we care about these things? And so in a lot of ways, it's what all the comedy is about. And more saving off death or the fear of it? Uh, the absurdity of all of it. Just yeah. like none of this makes sense. Yeah. The standards are absurd. I can't believe men and women are supposed to get along. Yeah, everything. Like, yeah. like can then you believe we die that? And then you die and then you fucking disintegrate. And this is the setup for all of it. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, that that's what drives everything is I just like, I can't believe that these are the situations. That's why most of my movies are not very imaginative because I don't need Thank it. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't really need it. I, I really feel like things are so bizarre that just trying to get along with anybody is ridiculousness. R ridiculous I will enough. say, I would like to commend you your the thing about your movies at the scale you were doing them in the 90s movies like me and dave made half baked but they were all sort of like premisey yeah sandler movies of that you worked on i think a little bit they were very premisey yeah they were very like i got a i'm a crazy golfer yeah. the cable or a, guy or, or yeah you made the cable guy the cable guy is pretty a little real it's basically just like an obsession movie yes right it's, um, it's unlawful entry or hand that rocks the cradle yes as a comedy right and but that's a premise i mean it was yeah, that's a premise. a premise but then you're then it just became like knocked up i got a got a girl pregnant or 40 year old virgin did that feel premisey well i think it was a premise that was steve carell's idea from a sketch he had been playing around with but never really completed at second city and then we both said what if we took it very seriously and it wasn't a premise movie past the name yeah and the poster and the, poster. And the look is a little like the mentos yeah. yeah it's based on the mentos ads that's the look <laughs> yeah because <laughs> they were mentos ads with that those colors and but the, there's yeah. also the eye line that was the novelty of your <laughs> yeah. movies yeah. your posters was the yeah. eye line the it was the class picture day. Mm -hmm. Whose idea was that? I, uh, I was it somebody uh, in marketing. I, yeah, I think uh, it was the Universal Marketing. Great. I, maybe it was Maria Pecker of Skya who we worked with on it, and the uh, I believe Art Stryber shot that photo. And but I asked someone about it because I wasn't there when they shot it. And I'm like, was it hard to get that look from Steve? And they're like, no, he he nailed a hundred. Yeah, of once them. they pitched it, it was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But your they movies were premisier, and then you started making movies like. Uh, it's just this is forty, or or even train wreck is just like eh, I'm a girl with a drinking problem a dating. relationship, yeah. or bridesmaids. My favorite one mm -hmm. in that that the, the reason I love bridesmaids is because that's a real problem that women have when they get married. It's like who's getting attention in the party and all that stuff. And and what Kristen Wiig and Annie Mumolo who wrote it were interested in was what do you do when like your friends are doing better than you and you can't even afford to attend the events around these relationship successes they're having and how bad it makes you feel and how it makes you look at your life about uh, you know how how you're doing are you behind everybody else but that's the i would add uh, besides improv which you invented um <laughs> i would put i would add that as like your a big contribution as like real mo real problems in movies, not I have to save my mom yeah. from the senior center, so I'm going to golf like a crazy yeah. person, like and or half picked or whatever. Like, uh, so uh, but, I, you know, I I've done those you. movies too. Yeah, of course you have. But you've I, done more of the real ones, yeah. I would argue. Yeah, it's a little bit more my wheelhouse, which a lot of it is from you know the people I loved as a kid, James Brooks and Norman Lear and Mary Levinson, and people like that. That's what, what I kind of understand more because I'm so uncomfortable and neurotic that I see all these little moments as like high stakes. Yeah. Just in general, you know, we're having a baby. What do we do? You know, to me, well, that's, that's enough. That's, that's as much of a premise as someone trying to murder us. Yeah. Well, I see it as the baby is going to murder your lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. That's what, that's what that movie's about. So yeah, well, that's great. That's great that you've been able to turn the terror <laughs> into, into uh, work. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's something so unhealthy about it. The idea of being, uh, and I think what, what it does is it makes you feel like there's safety in accomplishment and safety in having a job yeah. and being good at what you do and not being 
uh, irresponsible in your job or with your finances. You know, that's the, the neurosis of it is, uh, I don't want anything to get fucked up. So I'm going to really think years ahead and uh, every detail I'm going to game out what could go wrong here and what can I do right now years in advance to avoid that problem. You're, when you say years in advance, what are you talking about? Uh, it could be anything. It could be, uh, you know, say it's like a, it's a movie and, you know, before you've written it, you're already thinking about like, what would the trailer be? You know, wh why would anyone go to this? Who would need to be in it? What budget would I need? What budget would allow it to be successful? How many days might I need to, to shoot it? And just like everything that would wreck it, trying you're, to you're, figure it out. You've already worried about it. Yeah. And d do you have a clear memory of doing that with something? Everything. I mean, I don't uh, think so, there's an exception. So, Fortio Virgin, yeah. Anchorman, knocked up like you you were like is you would game out like is will a big enough start like all that stuff like do i who do i need to put with will ferrell well that's you know that was a script that they had that they yeah. asked me to to you know, jump on they had been trying to get it made for a while and uh they weren't able to and so it was just like a a growing team of we know there's an amazing movie here how can we get this set up yeah. And I think for every movie, you know, the funny thing about movies is in order to, you know, get them made, you have to really be able to tell people why they why they will succeed. Yeah. And that was a funny one because no one got it for a long time and I remember someone almost made it and they were like, "Well, why did, why does anyone want to see an anchor man?" And we're like, "Well, it's not that. It's it's an excuse to talk about uh, you know, sexism in the workplace, mm -hmm. and we, we didn't use the words, but it was toxic masculinity, and and right. and it's a way to do the jerk. You mean I'm gonna stay this color? We're basically trying yeah. to do movies like that, but people would talk themselves out of it, like, but no one's ever gone to an anchorman comedy before. Right? We yeah, we did it. We <laughs> ran the numbers, and there have there the only newsroom would be news radio or uh, news. Uh, what was the Albert Brooks one? Broadcast News. Or Broadcast Dave's News. Brooks. Broadcast News. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were like, wait, no one went to that Robert Redford, Michelle Pfeiffer oh, journalist. Damn it, it's so fun. Movie. So a lot of it is that you have to be able to sell somebody on the potential for it to be successful. Yeah. And 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 that's gaming it because you're trying to explain to them, like, here's why they will go. Yeah, like Will is a movie. He's on Saturday Night Live. And generally speaking, people from Saturday Night Live become movie stars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. You did have to explain it. Before you and McKay, the people that made comedy movies were not funny. They just were like, they liked comedy kind of, but they didn't. They were like producers. And then they go, like, you're supposed to be funny. What do you, and then, but you guys were the first, I guess Ramus didn't really produce though. Uh, Ramus wasn't a producer. Yeah. Maybe Ivan Reitman, but he didn't mm -hmm. really produce that much besides himself. But you guys felt like the first people who would bring in funny people to make funny movies. And before that, it was like a lot stuffier. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think about what changed I, because everyone from our generation loved those movies. Mm -hmm. You know, we all loved Ghostbusters and Stripes. And I think yep. the, the first movies that kind of before us that were big hits was like Wedding Crashers. And, you know, there was Clerks and Swingers. You know, so things were beginning to happen where they were clues to which way to go. There were all the giant Jim Carrey movies. And, and Adam, too. And, Sandler and, and, and the Sandler movies, you know, were getting bigger and bigger. And I just thought, how can you do a Jim Carrey set piece comedy but also have grounded, credible emotions. You know, can you do both? Can you do Barry Levinson and Shady Act combined? Yeah. And that was, the, with Fort Hill Virgin, what was in my head. Can I do the big, can I chest wax him and believe he's a real person? Yeah, that's, I, yes, I would argue that that is your, what you did, which is excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy the money. <laughs> hey, everyone. You know how I get how I don't I don't like inconvenience. I don't like uh, disrespect. I, I like pebble smooth experiences. Well, you know how tickets is often not that. Well, I have an antidote for that. Not an anecdote. I have an antidote for stressful ticket buying situations. And that, as you well know, is a game time. 
Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee. You can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. You're going to have fun. You're going to put on a cute outfit. And you're going to kind of dress like you're in the band. That's what people do, especially girls dress like I'm like, I'm going to, it's like a little extra cute, but a little frilly as well. Who's coming soon? Okay. All right. So football's about to start. If it hasn't started, I think preseason has started. I have a few things going to be airing during football on TV. This is live football. That's professional and college. There's a band called RBD coming to BMO Stadium. Uh, RBD, I ne literally not even close to have heard of them. BMO Stadium, never heard of that either. But God bless. Let the kids have fun. It's on game time. Tickets available, of course. Uh, soccer. Some kid named Peso Pluma is coming to the Honda Center. Never heard of him. He looks young and healthy and maybe a little goth. Maybe he's wearing eyeliner. I don't know. Have go see Peso Pluma. Let me know. Karen Leone. At the Honda Center, Sam Smith, I've heard of. They're going to be at the Forum. 50 Cent is going to be at the Crypto Arena. He's definitely a he. I think he would be pretty uh, confident in letting me know he's a he. And he would troll me in a funny way about it because he's a funny, one of the great trolls. Go see him in concert. I feel like there's a farewell element to it, and I feel like Busta Rhymes is on the tour with him because Busta posts a lot about it uh, on Instagram. I follow Busta on Instagram. Buster Rhymes hadn't seen him one time in 10 years, and he gave me a quick pound and said, what's going on, OG? Which still means a lot to me. He called me OG. Didn't love the old part, but did love that he went, what's good, OG? I just changed what he said. I think he said what's good. Lauren Hill's coming. Uh, no comment. Ed Sheeran, comment. Seems nice. Started busking in a, in the subway, so and no, one, no one ever tells the story. Game time is the place for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. That's... For squares, your rock and roll, baby, your hip hop, your last minute. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code BLOCKS for $20 off your first purchase. That's BLOCKS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code BLOCKS for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, g -g 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 guaranteed. Bird dogs, what are they? Pants and shorts, they make you look good. They're stretchy. They make khaki shorts. They're designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of uh, stiff, restricting cotton. The way shorts used to be, they, I was watching um, The Last Dance on Netflix, of course, and at one point, Steve Kerr is, it's at a Bulls parade, and Steve Kerr is wearing the dorkiest khaki shorts, you can't believe it, that we used to all wear. Even recently. They made khaki that it's like a knit fabric. It looks like khaki, but it stretches so you can get a slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Uh, and it uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. I like the guy uh, pitching that. Like, what's the deal with the fabric? Anti-stink. They look better. I've done this before. Here's how the shorts look. Here's how they used to look. Go to birddogs.com slash Neil or enter promo code NEAL for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash Neil or promo code Neil for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We promise you wore them recently on the plane and they were great plain pants birddogs.com slash neil self-esteem self-esteem you don't got it self-esteem is a great motivator as well i mean it's like what you said about not being arrogant but i think it's the beginning you know it's the, for me at least it's you know it's, it's the the seed of comedy which is you feel out of place you feel less than but you're also angry about it mm -hmm. you're like Fuck screw, you a little bit. Fuck you. You're wrong about me. Yeah. You know, I'm a bad athlete. 
you people only care about who is a good athlete. Yeah. And so now I'm some loser because I can't play basketball. <laughs> like, yeah. And so I need my own thing, which, you know, for me and for all our friends, like it becomes comedy. Like, can yeah. I have a little piece of something that no one else is interested in? Yeah. And maybe I can be good at that. And maybe you won't even care that I'm good at that, but maybe the world will care. No one in my high school was also interested in comedy. So I thought, well, maybe I can get this job because there's literally no one in my grade of 500 people that has any interest. I think that's different now. I'm sure there's a lot of people in there. But the high job, school. you were interviewing comedians in high school? Yeah. Was that the job you were talking about? No, the idea of just working as a performer yeah. or a writer yeah. that, wow, may, everyone wants to be a lawyer or a sportscaster. No one wants to write for Saturday Night Live. You got it. You went to USC, right? Yeah. And when you went there for film school, were you like, oh, wow, there's other kids that even like movies the yeah, way you do? Yeah, but even more so when I came out and I had done a teeny bit of stand up in high school and I went to places like the L.A. Cabaret and the Laugh Factory in its earliest, you know, creepiest yeah. carnation when it was just like a, this tiny little narrow yeah. space. I met all these people and I went, oh, my God, this is like the me from every high school in the country. Yeah. I used to say it was like the the, the B video from Blind Melon. Like, here, here's everyone I dreamed existed. Yes. And I didn't, I never had a friend like that. Yeah, it's an amazing moment. I had that moment in when I started writing for Singled Out on MTV. And I was like, these guys were, do, they, we would talk about things we'd all noticed on TV. And no one had ever, I never met yeah. anyone that noticed that before. And same thing with Dave when we did when I worked the door to comedy. I was just like, oh wow, these it's so fucking cool. You know who Steve Coogan is? Uh huh. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like that, and so you know that you know obviously it's the moment when your self esteem rises because you realize, oh, I'm not crazy. I'm not just yeah. some weirdo. And then you're validated for having an interest that people care about, and then you start performing and writing, and you get more validation. But the original seed of it is I'm not like everybody else. And I think at some point this will pay off. I don't, I hope it will. It seems like it might, but for me, especially like we're talking 1984, 85, the comedy scene was tiny. So I thought there's only like a hundred comedians in the world. So yeah. I could be number 101. I've noticed within myself that there, you do projects to try to like, let's see if I can, uh, you know, up myself or just give me myself a jolt. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But you start having more jolts in you, like your baseline goes up. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, like I can only criticize myself so much at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I wonder someone who's more successful than me, have you found that your baseline in general is higher than it was 30 years ago? baseline of my self-esteem self -esteem. Self -esteem. like you go yeah you chat gpd you're like ah yeah i've done enough i've done a bunch of shit well yeah you, i mean can it, you talk yourself out of it at this point i think you'd have to be crazy to talk yourself out of being talented at this point yeah i mean i think when i was younger you know when you when you first start doing well there are your friends who really support you and there are some people who are like annoyed and don't think that you have done anything right or you deserve it or whatever yeah yeah and there's all the, there's, there's, you know, not a lot, but like some people you go, oh, the fact that it's beginning to go well for me is really bothering them. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough thing because we're all insecure. Yeah. And, and some of those people evolved out of that, but there was definitely that moment of like, the fuck is he doing? Like, he, yeah, he's not good. What is, what's happening? And so I was always proud that over time, there's a relative consistency to the fact that like most of the work is decent and the stuff that doesn't work is like a, a, a noble try. Right. You know, so that gives me self-esteem. Like it wasn't a fluke over two years. Like I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. okay at this. Uh, and that helped my self-esteem. But at the same time, you know, the world is changing. There's new people. There's yeah. new people coming in. There's new styles. Oh yeah. You have to worry about irrelevance. <laughs> and you can just go. Yeah. E even the idea of trying to keep it going is enough to, make your self-esteem drop which is by the way that self-esteem drop is the thing that makes you work your ass off yes and like when we did the george carlin documentary me and michael bonfiglio the thing that i love that we noticed was the reason why george carlin evolved was first because cheech from cheech and chong made fun of him saying he was corny and just doing jokes about peas 
<laughs> and then later on, he watched Sam Kennison and said, I don't want to be like breathing this guy's dust. And so in two moments, he just redoubled his efforts to be really good. Yeah. And so I, I do feel like that kind of self-esteem issue, at least in your business life, yeah, uh, can force you to work harder and dig deeper. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that is the defense of low self-esteem. It's like, well, no, it's going to... The, the good part in terms of output is that these containers are very faulty. <laughs> they <laughs> yeah. can be like colanders yeah. in terms of like the self-esteem drops out. And the other idea that like in life you get used to shit very quickly. Mm -hmm. You get used to like getting nominated for things or getting money or get, and then you just go like it, your hierarchy of worry, the things change, but the amount of worry doesn't. Yeah. You're just still, you still have a certain amount of worry that you have to channel into something. Yeah. And it's also how much of my life self-esteem is connected to that. You know, there's how work much of it is. Well, luckily like in life, most people don't care about it at all, right? So, uh -huh. so it's not connected to, to that. You know? well, what do you think people care about in life? When you say they don't care about it, what do you think people are? You talking? It's not your kids because you yeah, work like your with family your kids. Does, yeah, but your family doesn't care. Or your wife, you work with yeah. your wife. Their judgment of you is not about that. The what people you the care most about, it's not about that at all. It's just like, are you a good person? Are you a loving parent? What do you feel? Okay. What are those standards? I mean, I, you know, for me, it's like, as I try to evolve as a, a sane person, you know, I, you know, a lot of this stuff, I go back to Gary because, you know, the whole of spirituality, a lot of it was filled by Gary talking about Buddhism with me. I would also like to pause here and say that the Carlin documentary and the Gary documentary, they're both on HBO max or whatever they're calling it now are two of the best if you want to feel like a comedian there are some montages of notebooks yeah. <laughs> that gary wrote some things that i've almost verbatim written mm -hmm. in his notebook uh that i'd written on my like that and steve martin's first three pages of born standing up i think are the best if you want to know what it's like these are the best examples of everything yeah, Gary had these journals, and I think they were mainly messages to himself. Mm -hmm. I always saw his journals as him talking himself off the ledge. Mm. So even though you might read it and think, oh, these are all like positive motivational things, like be more loving, be open, don't live in your ego. He's only writing it because the thing he's not writing is the exact opposite. Like that's the response to the bad thoughts. Yes. And, you know, for me... In a nutshell, that's what I'm trying to do on some level, which is go, well, what am I shooting for? I'm, I'm shooting for, you know, like that the, the scene with the Ram Das is talking to me and Gary in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And he just says, you know, it's all just loving awareness, you know, being a kind person, living in your heart, not in your head. And if, if I can get closer to that, uh, you know, and it's a slow hopefully continuous journey, then I feel better about myself and hopefully I'm doing a better job with people. Is that from inside or from outside? Is it you saw a look from Leslie or mm. Maude or Iris about like where you were like, oh, I'm fucking up and I need to be better? Or was it I'm unhappy generally, I'm anxious, I'm whatever, and I need a better way to exist. Well, it's both. I mean, I think the people around you are always signaling when you're off track uh, and, and you notice it. But the general work is like a daily practice of making those reminders what's most important in your life. Like the thing I like about Buddhism is uh, you know, they, they talk a lot about a beginner's mind. Like in mm -hmm. every moment, can you be completely open and not bring your story and your theories and actually hear people and ex experience what's happening. So the reminder of that is a game changer if you remind yourself. But you might forget about it for five months. And then one day you open up a book and go, oh, I forgot about that whole beginner's mind concept. Yeah, I know. And so you it's so funny. <laughs> I want to do a thing. I feel like we're a few years away from it. But I want all of my house to be LED walls. <laughs> and I want reminders. Yeah like beginner's mind but i you need to sequence it so it's not just 
you were, I can't tune it out. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, so maybe 10 of them. Like, don't forget, beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I have a checklist before I go on stage. Yeah. Of like things like, don't forget, you have to do <laughs> this. And, ah, and the, I, I don't think we're rare in that we need constant reminders. Yeah. And that's what the channeling journals are. And so for me, as someone who got to read all of them, you know, to be in like one of your close friends, mine, your mentors, like, oh, this from the seventies, this is what he was thinking, uh, had a profound impact on me, both the why, the wise aspects and here's where he fell short. Here's where he struggled. Here's where yeah, he didn't well, get Well, I mean, there. the thing that you hint at more with Gary than Carlin was like, Gary could be a bad guy mm -hmm. from like anecdotally. It's not sure. in the, you guys kind of hint at it, but like he could be a fucking asshole. Well, we tried to show it and that always comes from Gary slipping like, oh, he is living in his ego. He is being competitive yeah. or jealous. So the, the way I tried to show that in the documentary was this sequence with Ricky Gervais. So Ricky Gervais yeah. and him have this plan where Gary wants to interview him for the DVD extras for the Larry Sanders show. And Ricky's doing a show where he's interviewing his comedy heroes and they decide that they're going to do it on the same day. They'll do both, yeah. both interviews. And Gary tells Ricky or Ricky's people just don't go in my house. I'm when you know, I'll let you know when I get home and then we'll set up. And I guess he got home and like, it's fully set up, you know, in the backyard, yeah. the crew's there. And Gary, for some reason, feels really violated by yeah, this. Yeah, it's an incredibly strange sequence. In your, it's just you don't know what's happening. Gary Shandling. I have never met uh, Ricky before, so this is actually uh, thrill, uncomfortable. Yeah, and but it's very revealing of the, that side of Gary. Yeah, it just he feels violated, and we don't know what happened. We don't know why it happened. It could have been a miscommunication yeah. that Gary doesn't know anything about. Doesn't mean Ricky Gervais did anything wrong. I doubt he was just like, let's trick yeah, him let's and get in the him. house. Yeah. Right? So it's mainly in Gary's mind that he's wasn't listened to. Yeah. So it's hit some nerve. But then how Gary handles it is by just uh, trying to create a very awkward moment because the cameras are already rolling when he walked in the house. And it's almost like on some level, he's like, you want to see what awkwardness is like? You think you're the awkward guy? Let's go. Let's see how awkward you can get, which is both artistic and funny, but also cruel. Right. I didn't know if people got it in the doc because to me, the point of putting it in the doc wasn't to give Ricky Gervais a hard time. It was to show this is what it was like when Gary turned on you. Right. And it's rough. And then Gary, you know, he would, he justifies it as almost like an art experiment. Yeah. But, or he's teaching Ricky something, but really I think it's hostile. Yeah. For the most part. He looks, there's a shot of Gary I remember from the kitchen where he kind of looks deranged. Yeah. He looks like he's having some kind of mental, something's happening. A darkness that I don't, it seems like he didn't turn it on you very much. But Not he, too often. he saw, but he did turn it on people we know. That was like seeing his wounds. Like, yeah. there's the wound. Gary's an incredibly giving person, uh, amazing person. But yeah. for all of us, if, if you walked into us at the wrong moment and you saw the pain, the thing yeah. that we struggle with the most, that's what that yeah. looks like. Yes. And yeah, I don't want to say this like, well, I've never felt like, but there are moments where I recognize that look of like, oh, that must be what I seem like yeah. when I get violated or feel shitty or whatever. Or maybe it's the same look when you give Gary a script for Larry Sanders and he hates it. Yeah. And in his head, what he's, he's he doesn't want to be cruel, but all he's thinking is, I'm so tired and now I have to fix it. Yeah. And now I hate you. Yeah. Cause I'm too tired and I don't even know if I can. And if the show's bad, I hate myself. Yeah. Like, like you're, you're walking into that spiral. Yeah. You know, if the show's bad, I, I don't exist anymore. Yeah. Uh, and we know that from some of our friends, their standards are high and their self-esteem is so important that when they think it's going down. Well, yeah, it's a weird thing where they're letting you into this sacred process yeah it's so touch and go self-esteem wise and they're going like can you help me and you people like you and i are want to help them just want to yeah. for a myriad reasons but we want to help them and then if if it's not if we can't then we feel fucking awful yeah and but they they feel worse 
Yeah. Because they're the one who has to jump out of the plane. Because the stakes are so high. Yeah. It's not like, eh, it's okay if this episode's not good. Yeah. Most of them are good. I'm not worried about this one. Yeah. It's like the whole thing goes down. Yeah. With the quality dropping or the humiliation of being in something that you're not proud of that you can't stand behind. And it's funny because when I was reading the journals, I was like, this is pretty good because there's nothing negative about me. <laughs> I worked with him for many years, you know, and then at the end of one page, it was, he made a list of everyone who had let him down that year. And I was number two. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I let him down because I left the Larry Sanders show to shoot the cable guy. Right. And I didn't, I, he never told me he was upset about it. I just got a movie greenlit. Did you ask him or did you just say like, it was just assumed? I wasn't, I, I wasn't the showrunner. I was just like a staff writer. I right. didn't even think it mattered uh, yeah. if I was there or not. Uh, and so I don't think anyone really escaped that sensitivity, but I've been there where like things are falling apart and you get really mad at someone and you're like, wow, that's way too angry. But it, it's that panic of failure. Yeah. If someone in, uh, in this job is upset, it's because they're about to fucking bomb yeah because they counted on other people and they and they failed them yeah uh hyper vigilance mm -hmm. this goes to your three-year planning of everything right or yeah and a thing. general um what is the difference between being present and in the moment and not, it is hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is the definition of being out of the moment. Right. If I'm sitting here You're with scanning, you. are scanning, right. And I'm scanning, I'm going like, I wonder, do I look terrible in this thing? I wonder, I wonder what clip Neil's going to put online well, no, but, okay. on Instagram. Fine. I but I'm saying, a, <laughs> I'm saying, I've been doing that also. Yeah. Is that not part of being a person? It is, but there is a version of it which is just you know, where you really feel like I'm just missing things. Like, uh, you know, Letterman did some interviews in recent years. I, I think one of them was on Marin and he just said, you know, I feel like I missed a lot of the fun of the show mm -hmm. because I was so worried about the show. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what it is. It's like, are you missing yeah. out on life? Cause you're worried about some other aspect of life. Yeah. Like, can you really drop everything and be present right now? Yeah. You know, there's a thing that David Milch always said to me. Creator of uh, NYPD Blue. Yeah, and, and Deadwood. And Deadwood. Co-creator with Stephen Bochco, if we're going to get the credit. Let's go. This relates in some ways, but he would always say, don't ever think about writing when you're not writing. It's a complete waste of time to go, oh, when am I going to write? How is it going? The pressure to deliver. He goes, it's all wasted energy. It doesn't get you anywhere. He's like, only think about writing while writing just get your ass in the chair do your writing and then don't think about it at all it's he said it's like talking about going to the gym <laughs> he's like are you at the gym no that it doesn't mean anything it's just a wasted energy and stress and i think that's what true. about <laughs> ideas though well you know things come up i mean i i disagree with an aspect of it which yeah. is i feel like it as uh you know stand-up people or comedy people we have a little r radar open at all times yeah. for something funny Yes. Which is a, a different thing, maybe. But I, I do get what he's saying, which is you could torture yourself about, I didn't write today. I wonder if I'll write tomorrow. I'm going to go in. You know what? I had too heavy a breakfast today. I, mean, I got tired, I so there. I didn't write. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? I and like, what, what does that do except ruin whatever moment th this is? Yeah. You, are you, well, I, I guess you did go see uh, Cabaret eight times. Yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> are you like a helicopter parent? Do you worry uh, a lot? Well, that's not helicoptering as much as I really you know, enjoy it. I enjoy seeing what everyone in the cast is doing because the show is pretty remarkable. And it just brought me an enormous amount of pleasure to see it. I don't have anything to give to it. I, I'm actually just taking from it. And what's that feeling of watching Maud do it? What's the, what does it feel like? Well, I'm just very proud uh, uh, that she can do it, that she has the courage to do it. I'm proud of her level of commitment i think about the entire journey of her whole life to get to the place where she's that skilled uh, and that she could be that open and risk-taking as a as a performer anything that's good about maude i credit leslie yeah i think 80, am i 80%. right let's give her 80 <laughs> I mean, percent like like talent but i don't but what do you what do you think is you 
Mm, I don't know. I mean, for Leslie, I think she, she uh, in terms of performance, always talked about commitment. Oh, always talked about the only thing that's embarrassing is when you're not committed. Mm, that's interesting. Which is something I still can't even learn. Yeah. Uh, but uh, from me, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I had, you know, my kids in movies from the time they were like tiny. And I think they got comfortable being in front of people and expressing themselves. It, expressing yourself was valued. And so I think over the course of many years, and we didn't do that many things, it set in like, this is a good thing to do. It's good to make art. It's good to connect with people. It's good to take these types of risks. That thing about not committing is embarrassing. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like when you see someone and they're a half out of the scene and you know they're thinking about, is this going well or not? Yeah. I mean, and it's the same as what I'm talking about for myself, but you could see it in certain actors that they're not gone. Like some people, you see them, like, they are just gone. Yeah. And th that's a real skill. I think you and I, let's take this as an example, are worried about being boring. Mm -hmm. As comedians, it's like, are we, am I fucking boring? Or podcasts, mm -hmm. like, it's fucking boring. Because it's not that jokey. It's not the mm -hmm. pace. It's not like the thing. Yeah. So I think a little bit of taking yourself out of it. I think you owe it to other human beings to ask yourself every once in a while, am I being boring? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think it's like it, it's counter to uh, being present. That's a big lesson too, uh, in terms of stand up. that when I pay attention to it, I do better, which is it's okay to not get some laughs if it's all interesting. Mm -hmm. if the ideas are interesting. People will stay involved if you have something new to say or, or, or deep to say. And I always have to remind myself of that. Like that's what takes me out of terror of not getting the laugh because hey, this might be enjoyable to watch even if some of these things aren't scoring yet. Yeah. Well, that's Bernie Mac, I think, told Godfrey, like you don't have to kill the whole time. You just kind of have to, it has to be like you and interesting the whole time. You know, when you think about like who's, who we've lost that you miss, you wish they were out there making stuff. I always think about Bernie Mac. But I always think Patrice, but it's the same, it's kind of the same thing. And, and, and there's a lot of those people, but Bernie Mac, you go, oh man, we needed more Bernie Mac. Yeah. Well, he didn't, he, I don't, he didn't have that much film material. Yeah. That's the other thing. Whereas Patrice had, so has much. a good amount. <laughs> and if you dig online for Patrice stuff, there's great stuff. Yeah. And you could go, I'm going to watch an old Opie and Anthony with Patrice and he's yeah. talking for two hours. Yeah. Like there's and a lot Pat of stuff. But Patrice was great at being fucking rivetingly interesting. Yeah. Even if you don't know what the fuck he's talking about. And it's incredibly misogynist. And you're like, it's, I, he at least believes it or believes it that day. Or thinks it's funny. Yes. Or thinks it's funny. Correct. Um, and the, what do you do with the hypervigilance? It, I also like to say, I'm sure it's helped you. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's why it's hard because when you're hypervigilant as a producer, you're a good producer. Mm -hmm. But if you go home and you're still in that head, you're out of the moment. How do you learn to put the sword down? I mean, it's, I think it's a lifelong quest. You know, there are times where you're like, okay, when I get home, I'll take a shower. I'll try to end the day. Yeah. Or I'll do TM. Or, you know, how do I not care? But I feel like it's, it, I did work hard on it. And then it also naturally happened that I just thought, I'm really accomplishing nothing by thinking about what happened on the set today and how, how much could I reduce the amount of time I think about it Yeah, to be here with the kids. Cause I, when, you know, when my kids were born, I would sit, sit with them. They'd play on the ground and in my head, I'm just like, how come they don't like that script at the studio? <laughs> you know? And you, and it takes a, a while to go, Oh, this is ruining this. But, yeah. but when it, you feel like the survival of your family is based on that you're going to figure out how to make it work, uh, it's hard to drop because you really feel like it's part of your parenting to be able to make a living. Yeah, to provide for them. Yeah, so, it, so that, that's just a lifelong quest to quiet the mind, right? Like, and, and what good do I get out of it? Yeah, it's, and it is hard because it did help a lot. Yeah, but it didn't help me playing with blocks the podcast ladies and gentlemen there you go okay you know that 
I mentioned on the Blocks special on Netflix that I wore a thing called a Pavlock. It's a way to incentivize behavior within yourself because we all know these bodies are hard to control. You can set it to vibrate or shock you a little bit with a little electric, like bleep, uh, that's like aggravating, but memorable in that you will change your behavior. Like about a month ago, I kept pulling on my beard and I wore the Pavlov for a few days and whenever I would pull on my beard, I would shock myself and your body intuitively knows to stop pulling your beard. It's basically like a great way to help yourself. It's really good if you're a heavy sleeper. It'll wake you up. It'll vibrate on your wrist. It'll shock you on your wrist. It's also got just like a regular alarm, and it's got a clock built in. You can't see it, but it's whatever, through the app. By the way, it's like the only one on the market that I'm aware of. And it's releasing a new device called the Shock Clock Max, which I'm already happy about. Shock Clock Max is more than an alarm clock. It's the best waking up device and the best sleeping device. The features are impossible to sleep through and completely silent. It will wake you up and nobody else. Yeah, I've done this one too. It, you can wake up to a quick game, math problem, or a puzzle and activate your morning brain and do jumping jacks to turn off your alarm to start your day truly energized. It will not stop vibrating until you solve a puzzle or do jumping jacks, which sounds crazy, but life's crazy. And right now, Pavlock is offering my listeners the chance to pre-order the Shock Clock Max for half off. Go to Pavlock, P-A-V-L-O-K dot com slash max to pre-order your Shock Clock Max for just $99. That's a 50% savings. Even better, Pavlock is offering 40% off any existing product by visiting PAV. LOK.com and using code NEAL at checkout. That's Pavlock, P A V L O K.com, and use code NEAL to save 40% off and pre order your Shock Clock Max at Pavlock.com slash Max today. Pavlock, I stand by it. I guarantee it. Workaholism. Yeah, it's the same thing. And that's a different thing for me, which is like, you know, the safety of I can eat you know, is a big, is a big thing. Just from coming from a background, parents who had financial problems at different times where I just thought, oh, you better be on your game. You don't want to have to deal with any of this. And also I think, you know, you get a certain satisfaction from work going well that- You get, I, we get a lot from comedy, dude. Yeah. Identity, purpose, mm -hmm. meaning. Like I'll and then money and all that other shit, but like more than anything, it's the it's that you know like minded people and mm -hmm. similar goals and all that stuff. When you think about workaholism, are you trying to obviously addiction is trying to get away from a feeling? Is the feeling you're trying to get away from the like general existential dread? You know, it's hard for me to know. Like when I was a kid, I really got a kick out of just. 1970s show business uh -huh. and i think as you know whatever struggles i was having it could be solved by don rickles on the mike douglas show i just got an enormous amount of joy and in my mind i probably created a this perfect wonderland of hollywood where bob newhart was hanging out with frank sinatra and the mandrell sisters uh -huh. and so that became a goal like this will solve your problems can you enter that world it'll yeah. be it'll be safe there yeah and then feeling like you have to serve it by doing a good job like oh i'm gonna get kicked out yeah if i'm not doing a of this a thing good that job. saved me yeah and so what i always think about is what does healthy creativity look like what is what is the reason to Right. What is the reason to make a movie? What is the reason to do stand up? And it sounds corny, but if in your head you think, well, it's healthy for me to tap into creativity, I think that it's as close as I get to thinking about God as just the, you know, whatever, universal intelligence, just where does it come from? Like there's something fascinating about that any idea pops into your head, uh -huh. which I like. Um, but also, that it's a gift to people, you know, for you to share your story and your pain and turn it into comedy. Uh, it helps people and it makes them happy or it makes them feel less alone yep. or it helps them figure out ways that they can navigate. They can draw strength from it. You know, we've mm -hmm. done specials with Gary Goldman and Chris Gethard about, you know, 
their mental health uh, challenges and issues with depression. And they would get tens of thousands of uh, emails Response, and, yeah. and posts saying, this is, I needed this so desperately. Yeah. And it really helped me. I'm sure you have yeah. it as well. And that I think is- I got 11,000. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's creati creativity at its best and its purest. Is it, it's, a, it's a giving gesture and a loving gesture. And, you know, the other side of like ego, paying for shit, liking yourself, uh, I think it's fine. It, it's just the proportion could be better. You know, the, the more, like if I think about, no, I'm doing this to say something, I kind of do a better job most of the time. And do you feel like you're tricking yourself yeah, into but, telling yourself like, no, this is, yeah, it's probably half bullshit, but that's fine. As long as you get there, as long as, you know, uh, if I think about, uh, you know, like surprisingly the, the movie that people walk up to me about the most is this is 40. That's the one that people talk to me about all the time because it's just, here's how we're doing. How, how are you yeah. doing? Yeah. You know? And that's what's uh, meaningful to me. And I think it connects deeper with people because they, they sense it. Like, yeah, you know, I'm sharing something to help you out. And it's not just me sharing, like, you know, it's made up. It's the ideas of everyone in it. It's, you know, things that we've noticed about our friends, yeah. uh, things we've noticed about ourselves. But I think people sense the offering, like, how are you doing? You know, and it, because people walk up to me and they're like, oh my God, that's the movie we watch all the time. And I'm like, why do they watch it all the time? There, there's something about it that they're relating to. Well, it's to. like the, there's a thing, the, the level something emanates in you mm -hmm. is the level it travels to in other people. Mm -hmm. So it's like the most personal, arguably, thing you've done or one of. Mm -hmm. And then that's, and it, it's from like the realest, deepest level. And then it travels. That's where it goes to in other people. Yeah. Which is fucking great that would be the upside of workaholism. I mean, yeah. like, or, or what you're saying is if you do things for the right reason, they'll be received for the right reason. Yeah. And I also think that workaholism, you know, implies, um, trying to escape something with the work that you're self medicating. Right. Uh, you know, so you're having a bad day. So you just want to hang out at the comedy store all night, which isn't always the worst thing. But I think that, uh, there is healthy, super hard work, that's not demented and dysfunctional. And yeah. so it's like, can you try to get it to be that and not an avoidance of yourself or something? You know, like if you made a movie cause you just wanted to leave the house, <laughs> that's the wrong reason to do it. Have there been moments where you're like, I'm fucking up. With, oh yeah. Like with them, it just like you're producing too many things, you're shooting too many things. Mm -hmm. And you go like, why am I doing like, this is, I need to take a week off or I need to. Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely slowed the whole thing down because, you know, the story of my career is just no one wanted to make anything. And so we all wrote a lot of stuff. And then suddenly they're like, we'll make all your stuff. And so for a few years, we were making three movies a year. Yeah. Which is too many. Yeah. And so it was just surviving it and trying to support everyone and have everyone dig deep to do as well as we could do with those opportunities, but it wasn't a pace I ever was seeking. And so it's not really screwing up. It's just an odd timing thing. It's like when someone gets really famous, usually you notice that in the next two years, they make way too many movies. Yeah. Well, you get a lot of opportunities. You can't believe the opportunities you get. So you're like, I want, yeah, I don't want to say no to any of this. You've waited your whole life to, yeah. to work and yeah. then you're trying to manage it. And um, so there's a natural thing there that you deal with yeah that everyone we know has had that moment we're like oh my god i'm in yeah and then and then you're, you're just trying to handle it yeah kevin hart stayed there he's gonna about to pop up and promote something you can cash back five percent on travel purchase <laughs> people pleasing mm -hmm. which surprising do you ever feel like a power broker because you can help people so clear you help mm -hmm. you like i don't want to say you made people stars but you champion I think without people. you, yeah, you champion people, and then did you ever feel that? Because it seems counter to people pleasing. Meaning, people wanted yeah. to please you so that you'd yeah. help them become a star. I think people pleasing is always more just in the moment, you know, with everybody, with just like a general. Is everyone okay with me? Like I love that book, The Untethered Soul. Have you mm -hmm. ever read that book? Uh, I think I downloaded book. it, and not read it. Yeah, but so it's it's just all about how 
you have an irrational expectation that you can make every single moment of your life work perfectly. Mm -hmm. That the person will like you, that you'll say the right thing, that everything will be fine. And it's completely irrational. And so you're almost on eggshells trying to handle everything all the time. Like everything's okay as long as I don't screw anything up. And right. I think that's a destructive headspace to be in. It's better to go, you know what? I'm a good person. I'm doing my best. Yeah, like I can just relax. Approximately, like we'll throw the throw the dart and yeah. it, it'll land on the board somewhere. Yeah, I'm just fine. If like, I don't need to obsess like that. Like I, I that that's destructive to, to be in that type of headspace. I thought of that a lot this year about texting. Because <laughs> during COVID, I got insecure because I thought, the people who haven't checked in on me don't care if I die, right? <laughs> like it was almost too clear a thing. Like there were certain people that were like, how are you holding up? And then there were people that you like that you did not hear from in those two or three years. And you thought, wow, I'm not even on their list. Of don't die. Uh, yeah, for a check-in, yeah. like a health check-in. Yeah. And I started getting neurotic about it. And then I thought a lot about, well, who am I checking in with? Right. And almost in a manic way, I got very neurotic about it. And then. Did you make a list? No, I never made a list, but I just, I, I was aware and I felt bad about it. And then I realized, well, I'm doing it to people too, because you, we all know too many people. Like when you're in comedy, yeah. we know hundreds of people. Yes. But one day I was uh, not sober and it just hit me like, I'm going to forgive myself. And I'm going to forgive everyone and have no expectation for that. Only in the realm of texting. <laughs> in the <laughs> realm of like how often we all make contact with each other. Yeah. Because I feel like, especially in our business, you might go on the road with somebody and have a very intimate yeah. week with someone. And then two years later, you're like, I haven't talked to them <laughs> since like we talked for like seven hours a day yeah. for a week. Yeah. And there is a place in you where you could feel bad about it, but it's also irrational to think of the hundreds of people you're interacting with. And every time I make a movie, the crew's a hundred people. Yeah. So if I make 20 movies, 2000 people, uh, it, it, that doesn't really make any sense. So I decided to let myself completely off the hook in that. And it really made me feel better all year. I mean, and I don't know if anyone, I don't, that's, a, I, I've never had that issue. Meaning I just see this, I see sh like comedy shows as, as like, I say it's like a cruise ship yeah. and sometimes I see you on the Lido deck <laughs> and then I won't see you. Yeah. I saw you when you were doing your producer skill thing yeah. in what was it? February. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now it's August. Hadn't seen you. I assumed you were yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Jimmy said he saw you. Yeah. I'll see you. I'll see you. I'll see you on the, whatever the, the podcast deck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we text. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I don't want you to die. Exactly. But that's nice that you forgave yourself. And what, what were you not sober on? That's a very good question. Uh, although I have to say, like, you know, we've talked a lot about everything that's happening with the mind expanding things. Ayahuasca uh, and MDMA and mushrooms. And all that. And I, uh, I definitely think uh, just great stuff to be learned from all of it i'm fascinated by it i don't i haven't had the, the ayahuasca courage yet but i i think it's in my future you would love it it's you know it's gary connected mm -hmm. it's it's it it is that world mm -hmm. it's a deeper level it's arguably the deepest level of that sort of mind shift and spiritual connection yeah. It's the the most actual palpable longest term one you can do. Like seven hours of direct contact and then you keep it with you. Man, does that scare me. <laughs> Which is the reason to do it. So I'm gonna work up to it. Well, what about it scares you? I think because that you're already there. You're already like constantly kind of swimming in it. Yeah. Well that's that's what I think if I need to get my head around. I guess there's I used to have panic attacks. Uh huh. And so there's a part of me that gets afraid of experiences which I cannot end. Uh, you can, but it's going to be a while. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's food poisoning. Well, it's, you know what it is? Uh, it, it's surrender. Yes. It's letting go, which I think is maybe the most important lesson or block 
for me to learn to really let go. I remember I was on a plane once to Australia and I had this very, very strong feeling, the most spiritual feeling I've ever had in my life of a voice saying, surrender, surrender. And it was, I don't even know what it was. It was unlike any moment I've ever had. And I feel like ayahuasca in a way is the, but did is you watch the little Richard documentary? Yes, I did. He had a, on a flight to Australia as well. It, what was it? He found God basically, or yeah. he like went back to God. Mm -hmm. He also like disavowed his sexuality, yeah. which I was hope I was hoping you would do, but um, stop being straight. Yes. Um, your body. Yeah. It's funny mm -hmm. the amount of guys on here who all confess to body stuff. Yeah. yeah. In, I, me included, in terms of just like gripping Marin caught me gripping my love handles on stage one time in a very <laughs> subtle way and i was like felt but what is your body stuff well i think you know you I'm, look I, less fat than you've looked yeah that's that's the goal yeah but i think i'm always thank you ozempic <laughs> i well i have a funny ozempic story but i always am at a weight where people i look like i just lost weight that's very funny. That's, that's that's my weight and and true. <laughs> that's your that's your weight. Yeah, we call it the Dave Rath in the business. Uh, he's very skinny. He's Dave very Rath. skinny. Yeah, but in my head, he's overweight. Yeah, he's like he's big boned. <laughs> yeah. So every time I see him, I'm like, "You just lost weight," but he hasn't in decades. Yeah. But um, I went to this vitamin guy. Gave me all these vitamins. Again, you can't. Don't look up the vitamin guy. You can't get there. You, you got to net worth minimums. There's just a it's lot. Cutting edge, cutting yeah. edge. Yeah. And so he gave me all these vitamins, and they gave me like a shot. Give yourself a, a shot. Of this once a week with this. And take all these vitamins for this reason. Da, da, da. Now I'm so dumb that I don't ask what the shot is. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know what the shot is. I mean, I may have I looked at what the name of it was, but didn't recognize the name. This is what <laughs> Barry Bond said about. <laughs> <laughs> about steroids yeah go yeah. ahead so i so i never like you're just rubbing the cream on <laughs> and so i take the vitamins i'm really good about the vitamins but i like i'm always uncomfortable giving myself an injection because i literally just think i'm gonna have an air bubble and die like i just have oh, an yeah, irrational yeah, yeah. i'm gonna yeah. kill myself by accident yeah so so I, shot i was thinking like a but you're talking about a needle and a shot oh, no, in the butt yeah great so i i do it randomly like i'm not being good about it you know so over 20 weeks, maybe I did it six times or something like that. You're supposed to do it every day? Supposed to do it once a week. Got it. So I don't really do it enough, right? So then we check the blood work. All looks good. Everything has gotten way better. And uh, then they give me slightly different vitamins and the shot. And then I go, what is this shot? And I think it it's <laughs> not Ozempic, but like basically Ozempic. And then I thought, this guy didn't even tell me he was giving me this drug. Like he never explained it to me. Like Just I'm giving like, you and this. And then this is part of it. Like we didn't even talk about what the shot was or that. And so I was just laughing. Like I, I was like almost tricked into taking. Yeah, you didn't. It was involuntary. <laughs> that's funny so you got like it's like me too but with ozempic yeah and it's always, got, it, I, but i always feel like i could take ozempic and still gain weight i feel like i'm the person you that believe can pull that, that, off. that what you, you're capable of yeah yeah i can i can beat ozempic. it's like the people who would beat the gastric bypass they would <laughs> pop the like chris exactly. christie kept popping the fucking stomach thing <laughs> yeah. multiple times apparently yeah what's your you like i think you just like snacking oh man i mean i feel like food as a self-medication reward shame eating like it's all it's all good what's your shame you know just binging knowing it's bad for me and then taking it too far and i've gotten so much better because like our house doesn't have a lot of junk in that's it that's the key yeah. you just can't have it yeah i can't have it but i you know i find ways to sneak but when i was a kid you know my mom would buy like chocodiles remember chocodiles rem yes. it was like twinkies with chocolate on them and we liked them so much that the second they got in the house, I would like hide half of them. I would just open it up and hide half of my brother and sister so that I wouldn't not get enough of them. And when my parents got divorced, I used to like make myself hamburgers and grilled cheese sandwiches and eat Entenmann's cake with it. And like there was a lot of food happiness. Got it. Happening. And no one could, neither parent would say don't. 
because they were never. they were vying for your attention. It was in one discussion of health that we never no diet, no child. health. Those are the rules. <laughs> like <laughs> there was never like eat that because it's healthy. Don't eat that because it isn't healthy. Literally no discussion of health. I didn't eat broccoli till twelfth grade when it was in a Chinese food. I I, so I never ate salad as a kid. The vegetables generally corn or peas from a can. I just didn't even know what healthy food was. And then when I lived with Sandler when we were young comics, we loved to eat. We would talk about it all day like, oh, man, we're going to go to Red Lobster tonight. And and even now we'll reminisce about meals. Oh, God, do you remember that night we went went to that restaurant with that Chinese food? <laughs> What's great is everyone hearing this can hear Sandler doing it. <laughs> do you remember that place? Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy, the beefsteak Charlie's. Uh, you know, like, yeah. It, and so... That was all also connected to being a bad athlete because I was the youngest kid in the grade. I just resented anyone who was accomplished with physical things. So it's it's also a struggle to not be angry at the idea that I have to do anything for my health, exercise, food. Like it, it feels connected to somebody well, it, that it tortured could, me. What's the best shape you've ever been in? The best shape I've ever been in was, it's so funny. Uh, someone asked me to do a movie, but it required me to be kind of ripped. And I said, no, cause I'm like, I'm not going to get ripped. How much, how much time would that take? And uh, so I can't eat anything. The best shape I've ever been in, I think maybe during COVID I lost like 17 pounds and got healthy, probably out of just general health terror. And did you like it? I liked it, but not enough. I mean, you just, like not as much as you like food. It's so hard to not eat like bread. Like it's so easy to not lose weight mm -hmm. because it, like you can eat great all day. And then at the end of the day, you just have like bread with your chicken and that day's killed. And and that. You, yeah. You, and then you were all like, well, this day's fucked. I might as well have ice cream. Exactly. Where are the chocolate dials? And I have a theory, which I talked about in stand up once, but it is what, what I always think, which is I think no matter how much you eat, you can only gain one pound a day. So once you let it go, and by the way, there's no science behind this. Mm -mm. I really feel like you can only gain one pound in a day. So if you're going to let it go, really let it go. Oh, right. Because it's, you're already, you already gained the pound. Yeah. And it's not going to be two pounds. For some <laughs> reason, I've decided that's science. Great. It is not science. Great. But that's what I've, I've decided. Yeah. Well, somebody, a buddy of mine made the observation, and I think he's right. If you drink tea with dessert, it melts the dessert really <laughs> in your stomach it doesn't at all <laughs> but just the weird things that we all go like you know yeah. what i've intuited something yeah that's entirely made up and pure nonsense all right um final two questions what things have you done that helped you with all this shit meaning therapy therapy uh yeah i've been in therapy since i was 22 or 23 I've done some ketamine treatments. Okay. Did you like? I did like that. I okay. thought that really helped me with anxiety. Oh, good. A great deal. I think I got a lot out of that. Um, guided? Like you would take guided. it and talk or take it Someone's and Someone's there to make sure I don't do don't anything window, weird, yeah. but they're not really asking me any questions. But I, I, I did have a very positive response to it. Great. Um, you know, I'm a self-help junkie. I just read everything yeah. to the point of drowning in it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's easier to go loving kindness like can i can i get the whole thing into like two words yeah you know or there's a thing in buddhism about like how you should be like a cylinder where you're just completely open and if you don't have your story and you don't have all your theories you could just enjoy life and like if i just remind myself of that the day goes better okay so i ask everybody and you as somebody who's done this a lot movie of your life who plays you? What's the arc? <laughs> wow. As a guy who's made five movies about his life. Um, but I'm talking about like, what's the Judd Apatow biopic? The, the, that's funny. Like, what is the, what's the story? It is funny because when you make movies and television, you are always pulling from your life. Yeah. But pieces, and it's so, I always say it's like a third, a third me, a third completely made up, a third observations of my friends. Yeah. So if it was all me, oh, I think the most insecure thing I could say is I can't even think of anybody uh, exactly like me 
because it requires a certain lack of charisma. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the story? What is the story of uh, what's your story? Mm. Meaning do it from like childhood to now. Like what's the arc? This is fascinating to me too, because you made so like, because parts of you had scenes in Freaks yeah. and Geeks of like watching yeah. uh, the Mike Douglas show and like the meaning yeah, of that. Yeah, that's probably why it's a hard one because yeah. I've mined it and spread it out among yeah. so many oh, things. Oh, you mined it and spread it out. E mm. Even as like in other people's movies when I'm yeah. just pitching them jokes or scene ideas or emotional ideas, like I've just, you know, like took well, it all, all right, the Who were the you bones. in 1980 and who are you now? Like that's the... Yeah. That's that's what I'm looking for. I'm always trying to just understand that. I guess what I'm saying is the reason why I've made all the movies on some level is as a way to understand something. So in some ways, like you sit down and you write a screenplay to figure out why you're writing the screenplay. Right. You know, why do you write funny people? Right. And then years later, you realize like, wait a second, Sandler isn't one of my comedy friends. He's actually my mom. Right. Right. And oh, and what am I exploring? I'm exploring is comedy a solution to all of our emotional problems or the thing that holds us back because we're so obsessed with these careers that we're not getting relationships and we're not connecting in a healthy way because we're worried too much about our success and being funny. And so in a lot of ways, you know, a lot of what we're talking about like is in funny people, but spread among different characters. Yeah, because it's uh, not. Like, is this worth it? And is it, why am I doing it? And what do I sacrifice by being so obsessed with comedy so maybe my story would be a little bit about comedy as a way to survive uh, and the arc to see what i was feeling that made me need comedy to survive emotionally and to slow to try to slowly let it go to be a a, a good person a good parent a good husband but can i still stay funny if i lose the madness that built it yeah well that seems like your life's about balance yeah trying to trying to balance it and still hold on to it. Cause a lot of people say, uh, you know, you, you'll hear from people w when they got sober, they say, I really thought that was part of my creative process. And then I realized it was just holding me back. Yeah. Yeah. I it's also I, just a reflex. Yeah. If you've been doing it as long as you or I have, it's just like, you just like fucking your brain will just go like a joke that you're not like, I need to think of a, yeah. you're just like, it'll just come. Can I be sane and still good at this? Yeah. Or can I be sane and maybe I don't need to do it? Yeah. Like maybe it's like, that was enough. And go, go do something else. Well, yeah, I always feel like that. Like I'll, I'll, if I don't feel like I need to do it, I won't do it. I'm doing it to be happy. Yeah. And if there's a better way to do it, I'll just do that. I'll do the other thing. Sometimes I'll say, I think I need to go into my, poetry phase <laughs> like would it be healthier to just write poems and not show anybody yeah and not have any of the needs surrounding it but i also think that that's a lack of growth because then you've just lost all courage to risk sharing yeah well that would be the third act for you would yeah. be figuring out how much of each yeah right that would be the third act third act yeah i had an idea for something i, I don't remember if it was uh for someone else or for me but it was that somebody finally got healthy and then they made something like a movie or a play and the end of it would be that it was terrible uh-huh but they were happy and they were fine with it yeah, <laughs> yeah. no that's hilarious because sure. <laughs> it is like the opposite of there will be blood where it's like no i i'm finished but it's it's terrible <laughs> but now it's all mediocre I've, yeah i've learned i don't need it's fucking great that's why most rock and roll from older people tends to get weaker because i think those people get saner i totally agree <laughs> like or they or they go in it like i would say billy joel who i know you love did his career backward mm -hmm. where it was like he wrote love songs young <laughs> and then he wrote like protest songs in his 50s and it was like what are you what are you doing we didn't start the fire the shit like that where it's like mm. Um, Judd Apatow was here, everybody. Thank you for thank you for making the time. My pleasure. Um, the audience needs to know how far a drive it is to get here. The level of commitment. You're talking about just like the le the class levels you had to drive through. I meant to go uh, from Brentwood to length. Hollywood. Of just like oh, just, just like just, locking the doors more. Yeah. <laughs> is there like a level of lock I can and like fucking hermetically seal the windows? It's like oof. I didn't feel in danger, but I did feel like. I was going to run out of gas due to the length of the drive. Shout out to Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.